Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Richard Barron, the Executive Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs at MU and the Executive Director of NextGen Precision Inst Health In Initiative. I wanna welcome you all to our second NextGen Discovery Series presentation. These discussions are intended to keep you updated on NextGen progress, as well as highlights, uh, as well as highlight precision health research and present cross-cutting topics that are essential to our success. We received dozens of emails after our inaugural discovery series presentation in February. Faculty from across the UM system came to us with interdisciplinary research ideas and we hope to keep up the momentum. So our speaker today is Dr. Russ Waitman. He's the Director of Medical Informatics for Next Gen Precision Health, and he holds joint appointments at uh, the University of Missouri Columbia and University of Missouri Kansas City. Since joining the UM system in 2020, he has worked to establish new methods so investigators across the system can access electronic medical records for research purposes. He also serves on the board of the Tiger Institute for Health Innovation, a public-private partnership between the University of Missouri and Cerner Corporation. Recently, Dr. Waitman was named director of the Data Science and Analytics Innovation Center, or DSAIC, which is a collaborative next-gen informatics project between UMKC and MU. Actually, uh, uh, I was looking at my script that I had written. It's, he's the co-director uh, of the uh, D Data Science and Analytics Innovation Center. Today, he's here to discuss how next-gen medical informatics is deploying wider access to clinical data and engagement methods to conduct, to conduct prospective clinical trials and observational studies. He'll also highlight ways you too can leverage this infrastructure to support your research programs. And I'm sorry for the background noise. I'm in Kansas City and there's some movers in my house. And, uh, uh, but with that, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Waitman. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rick. Um, so thank you. I'm going to talk about um, really, if you look at the plan for next gen, if you look here at Columbia at the pillars, pillars have a foundation. And so uh, medical informatics and data converting into information is foundational to discovery and foundational to knowledge generation. So I want to just start with that observation, you know, reproducing what you're observing is the cornerstone of science. And we have huge potential to learn every day as uh, data accumulates and is organized and available for study for that process to serve as a cornerstone for science, not just at one particular health system or clinic, but across the country. Uh, I'm going to highlight kind of a lot of work in medical informatics, my past work of how that's proceeded from investments from the NIH and then from the a group called PCORNET, which is funded by the People-Centered Outcomes Research Institute um, that has been created growing out of National Institutes of Health Research uh, and how that provides a strong foundation for us. I'll then talk about the fact that we're actively involved in this and renewing our application for continued funding. I'll talk then about the data environment we're creating aligned with Cerner's choices of technology, but managed as University of Missouri resource and then uh, close with some commentary on just the wealth of opportunity we have together. So um, if I go back, so I'm, I'm originally uh, came to the Midwest region again, I, I was here for college and actually lived here as a high school student in uh, Eastern um, side of the St. Louis metro area over in Illinois and then went to Washington University as an undergrad. But coming back to the Midwest from Vanderbilt, I, I had learned a lot in informatics at Vanderbilt, but I realized, you know, really, when you look at NIH funded research and clinical translational science awards, such as the effort led by Rick at the uh, Kansas City region, um, data provides a cornerstone platform. And in 2010, we would give a standard story that we're going fishing for data. So we embrace that. We have a bird heron, which we called our project that goes collects data. And just like fishing, you got to have some things in place. It's good to get a license. So you work with your partners around developing business agreements. You then need something more than your hands to collect data. Uh, so have a fishing rod or a bass boat um, being here close to Lake of the Ozarks. And so I made a choice then to say, let's use some existing openly funded NIH tools because if we don't, if we use other tools that are used openly by other people in the research community, there's more of a chance for us to be collaborating nationally. The next step is you want to know what you're catching. 
so uh, initially, if you're just organizing data from one campus, it's, it's perhaps a secondary goal, but trying to align the information you're collecting in a way that matches national standards lets you know that, you know, am I looking at the data in a way that can be compared with others? And then finally, you want to stock as much tasty fish as you can. So each investigator you run across, every clinician, every patient will have unique problems. And uh, just having one type of data doesn't suffice. Uh, you need not just how the patient's diagnoses change over time, but you want to know their vital signs. And increasingly, you want to know their patient reported outcomes and social determinants of health that influence health. So if we look back in time, and this tool I2B2 has been used both at UMKC and at Mizzou for years, it allows people without knowing how to program to quickly look at data, see who's got diabetes, who's in a research registry, and who has a high hemoglobin, and then get a count after a couple seconds to know that, hmm, there's nine, uh, you know, almost 500 people that might be eligible for my study, either to recruit prospectively or to obtain data on these individuals. So that worked really well and continues to work really well for, for many institutions across the country. Um, as we then approach time, you know, we then figured out how can we serve data off of this tool that lets you query? Because knowing feasibility is one thing, but actually having the data to actually support the study is critical. So um, we were very successful there as well of providing data from this resource. And one thing I would note and highlight is most of the use you have, while as an institution, you wanna provide uh, from a security standpoint and privacy standpoint, the minimum necessary, because most clinical researchers are, are following up with their patients, they are, have an IRB approved protocol, it wound up being about 40% was fully de-identified, about 60% would contain protected health information. So it's really important to support both types of users. Um, well, that was really great. We got a lot of things accomplished. We were serving our local community, uh, but uh, as this uh, cartoon from Peanuts shows, nobody is happy where they are. So what's evolved then I would say coming out of 2013 to 14 timeframe was people in informatics were really happy because they could tell people, hey, if you want pizza and you like anchovies and you're going fishing for data, I can help you get that information electronically. You don't have to have your residents abstract data by hand from the chart anymore. And then high level researchers would come along and say, yeah, that's great. But you know, really, I want to use somebody's recipe for how they do their study design. Um, my joke here is there was an effort called Precision Medicine Initiative that's now called the All of Us Cancer Initiative. And that specifically called for a different way of organizing your data. So you, what was happening nationally around this time frame is there's several competing ways that different epidemiologists, statisticians, and uh, conceiver of large scale studies were saying, I wish you organized your data this way. I wish you organized your data this way. Um, and that would be a challenge for people who are in the institution in informatics and say a vice chancellor researches. Do I have to design separate ovens and jars for each national initiative? Um, so, and then when you're doing this work and you're trying to support these national initiatives, remember how I was saying secondarily getting your data standardized, you know, is, is not as high of a priority. Well, once you're doing nationally standardizable research, which is what you want, if you want to show your findings reproduce around the country, it becomes really critical to line up your data so that if you're talking about blood pressure, it's consistent across your institution with other institutions around the country. So that becomes a very important task and coordinating all that data does take time and effort. So that will is, I'm gonna lead you then to one of the main national responses to this uh, in partnership with the National Institutes of Health was that the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which was created in 2010 by the Accountable Care Act decided to do something bold and actually set up a national network uh, with patients at the, at, as a core component of this. And we've had a wonderful opportunity, both myself and the University of Missouri to be part of this initiative. And so um, what would have happened in the past, and I'll have a, is that a lot of times people would do large scale research and they would build up their data infrastructure or build up their recipes for how they're gonna study it. And then once that large study finished, they would disassemble the stage and then have to rebuild that. So our vision with the Cornet that's been realized all for the past uh, eight years is that actually we have a network of networks that persist electronic healthcare record data from patients. 
we have over 66 million people with data accessible to do long studies looking at observational information. But also in terms of patients seen within the last year, there's about 30 million people seen at these institutions within the last year that are eligible for doing clinical trials or other ways of engaging patients around opportunities um, such as doing patient reported outcome measures and surveys. Um, so it's this national resource. Mizzou has been part of this for a, quite a while as has University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, and it's because it's national in scope, it's organized into sub networks and allows patients and providers and other stakeholders to work together to conduct studies and trials. So a couple things to highlight is um, when you look at the data landscape, you'll notice there are other, there, there's a lot of competition in the data space and much of it may be commercial and may be focused on de-identified data, which is great, but it does make it hard to go back and actually engage the patients and the providers, caregivers that care about those patients in getting engaged in research. So PCORnet is a distributed network that at the heart, each institution participating has a capability to really engage their patients. Um, and uh, it's also connected, importantly, to a lot of researchers at each of the campuses. So in addition to, to patients and clinicians, there are researchers at each of these institutions who have their ideas that they can bring forward and also engage with the patients to develop new ideas. So if I, this is a pictorial representation of the fact that the network is composed of sub-networks. It currently has two insurance plans participating and patient partners and then a national coordinating center. And the way the network works then is, is in addition to kind of our health systems and clinicians and patients and insurance plans, we can also link in additional external data sources. Um, this is a pictorial representation right now um, of what the network looks like. We are the Greater Plains Collaborative in the middle. So this dot here, and these are our institutions, which you'll see it has pretty broad national representation though, um, currently lacking representation in the California region. Um, and if you were to look at a heat map where you could kind of see what's the level of density of data that's available, you would see that uh, Missouri is very well represented in, especially in central Missouri by our campus. Um, when I talked about the challenge of getting data standardized and being usable, um, the way this happens is, is we define what's called a common data model which is shown in green, where everyone agrees to standardize how they represent key medical information like diagnoses, what drugs are being ordered, uh, what are lab results, what procedures were done, what are basic demographics. But then we can also link to additional data. So different networks are specialized. Our network is notably specialized in obtaining tumor registries, which provide detailed data about the progression of cancer and the treatment of cancer at institutions and bring in from a precision health standpoint, molecular markers for different types of cancer. So if you've ever heard of uh, ER positive cancer or triple negative breast cancer, those markers are available via tumor registry data and they can be linked to the common data that's commonly collected. So what do I mean by a common data model? The idea of a common data model is if you look at electronic health records that are being used in billing systems across the country, each site may have the data they're treating patients of all types, but the way they have it encoded in their databases may be very different. So if you were to look and say, I wanna recruit Asian Americans to a study, at one site, it may be stored in the database in text as Asian. Another site may store it as 401, and another site may store it as Asian American. So what has happened throughout the network is agreeing upon a standard set of values that we're gonna to use to encode variables such as race, ethnicity, uh, age, height, weight, and diagnoses, vital signs, and lab results. So what that lets us do is investigators can now approach the national research and ask a question. We have intake processes at the national level and at the regional level to look at those and then have them be distributed across the country and results returned. That's kind of what I would say is kind of the bread and butter of the cornet is the ability to uh, design studies, distribute the analysis plan to the sites and the sites can give back responses in typically using aggregate data without having to worry about uh, disclosing protected health information. 
The other key element of PCORnet is with patients at the center of PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, is patients are involved throughout the process. And we try to work with investigators to encourage them to get patients involved on the front side when you're thinking about your research question. Have them collaborating in the design. Obviously, especially when you're doing clinical trials, patients are the core participant in the study and getting their feedback on how the study is being conducted and how to improve recruitment and how to improve the patient experience is a great addition to studies. And then finally, how do we disseminate the findings and share them with individuals to drive change in clinical practice and, and, and the patient's life? Um, so I wanna give a couple examples. So you can use this network and we can use this network across both of our campuses. Our vision is to bring both of our campuses and other health partners for the University of Missouri in Columbia and in Kansas City, but also I'll mention WashU and partners on the um, eastern side of the state. Um, it can be used to just do some simple feasibility determination of who might be eligible for a study, which sites would you want to be in your study. Um, you can do descriptive analysis. So some example questions are, if there's a new heart failure medication, how are patients doing on it? Do they have better symptoms than they did when they took older medications? Another thing um, is bariatric or stomach surgery, you know, where you're, you're obese and you really have tried many ways to control your weight and it just isn't working. And you might think there are three ways they would do these stomach surgeries. How are they working? Uh, which one is better at keeping the weight off? Um, although one, they may have higher risk of adverse events. And then another example would be a lot of people have had heart issues. They may have had a heart attack in the past or a catheterization procedure. And, and they're told to take aspirin a day. Uh, but no one's ever really known, should you take a little pill, a baby aspirin, or should you take a regular pill? Um, if you take a, if you're a big guy, maybe the little isn't enough. Um, on the other hand, if you take the big pill, there's a risk of bleeding. So um, that's an example of a prospective study we can answer with the cornet. So in the first example, there was a study called Provide HF, which was actually in partnership with uh, Novartis, I believe, the pharmaceutical company. And they wanted to do a look at 400 patients with chronic heart failure and see as they take this new medication, how quickly can we get out, get in touch with those people, look at their health record data. So, so don't bother them with collecting additional data, look at what we have, but then also complement it with the ability to do surveys to collect additional uh, patient reported outcome measures um, using a tool called the uh, it's actually a, car, a Kansas City uh, cardiovascular questionnaire developed by colleagues at UMKC, notably John Spurtis and others, and others at University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, and so that study was very effective. We showed that we could recruit 400 people ahead of schedule across 16 sites. Um, the study team found that they got more timely access to the survey data they wanted, and it was also our first opportunity to use a national initiative called Smart IRB, where institutional review boards, those are the people who review study protocols uh, ethically and from a patient safety perspective, um, were agreeing to kind of let one site be the lead of the, the IRB process and the others would defer to that. So that was a very effective example of use of the network. Another example is the bariatric surgery study. This was purely observational, but we could pull together 65,000 patients and look at the data across the time period and actually see which of these three patient procedures are most effective at weight loss, but also pay attention to um, which ones may have greater safety concerns. So um, the citation is below. Um, and again, yes, over 100 million records were able to be analyzed. A sub-analysis was able to be done looking at adolescents that had not been done to date. Um, and this was uh, able to answer the question. Uh, the ruin actually uh, will keep the weight off better than the others, although it has a higher risk of uh, adverse events in the first uh, 30 days. The last example uh, of demonstrations of cornet is this study called Adaptable, which is an aspirin dosing study I mentioned. And the goal here was to show, could we at much lower cost recruit 15,000 people to this study and randomize them to either receive 81 milligrams or 325 milligrams. And one thing highlighted here is from the beginning, we had patient partners involved in the study design and providing guidance on how we uh, complete the study engage individuals and conduct dissemination. 
Um, so what you see here then is, is that um, throughout that process, from a patient perspective, you had newsletters being used, you had study communications being revised by patients, both at the national level and the regional level to tailor it to the audience. Um, you had clinicians being engaged as well. And we were able to recruit all 15,000 patients across 40 sites around the country in 38 months, which was actually quite good. Um, there's a website for the aspirin study, and there's now launched a large trial called Preventable, which will seek to recruit 20,000 people across the Cornet and the VA who are over 75 to see if Lipitor as a drug also provides health and well being and include, uh, improves longevity as well as potentially reduces dementia. So that's an example building upon the prior example. And that study is funded by the National Institutes of Health. So PCORNET, you know, as we built this network starting in 2014 is operational um, and we've done several demonstration projects. There's a myriad of other studies happening, but I really see for next gen building upon what we already have and now that's being continually funded provides us a strong foundation for moving forward because we in Missouri want to lead and our ability to lead is uh, really the ability to plug into, to collaborate nationally with other individuals. Uh, and to give you a perspective of this, just to reinforce this, there was a gentleman at Duke University, um, I believe he's still now back there, but Rob Califf was the head of the FDA briefly. And as he was leaving uh, Duke to join the FDA, he noted, we're in a time of transition. Traditionally, these large clinical research studies would have recruitment sites in a coordinating center, and it would all be controlled centrally, kind of like the railroad. So Burlington Northern kind of owns the track, they own their switch yards and their hubs. Um, and that's changing more to a model where it's more like a highway, where the tracks are not tracks, they're, they're flexible roads and they're laid down between various sites. And as different people want to lead different projects, they can lead it out of any site in the network. So the hub can change over time and the number of sites that participate can change over time. And so what's happened since this visioning picture in 2015 largely has come to reality. You have large initiatives. This Sentinel project, previously called Mini Sentinel, is now called Just Sentinel and it's run by the Food and Drug Administration. And they want access to these data networks to understand post-market drug safety issues. But Cornet is wanting to compare effectiveness of treatments that are very patient-centered. The NIH and the uh, Clinical Translational Science Awards want us to also support um, novel drug development. And all of them can kind of assemble on the fly, calling from different hospitals and different outpatient clinics and different patients to help organize to solve specific studies. So where we are now, as I've come to Missouri in October, is really picking up the network and we've moved the headquarters here to Columbia. And what we want to do is we found out actually just in February, they put out an announcement that's a limited competition for us to renew our network for an additional three years for roughly $8 million. I think I found out today it's actually going to be a full 8.7 we requested. So we're very focused on landing this new funding opportunity so we can continue to support the network. For NextGen with its state mission, we plan to both include UMKC and health partners like Truman Medical Center in the data infrastructure, but also add uh, Washington University to the east of us who we collaborate with through the NIH's CTSA program. And that'll create broader connectivity across the state for large scale data and large scale studies. We're also adding a great institution, University of Texas down in Houston, which joins our campuses that are in uh, San Antonio and Dallas. Um, some highlights from this are calling for us to um, really focus on strengthening our ability to serve other federal agencies like the National Institutes of Health, a, uh, the Agency for Health Quality and Research. And then I specifically see in our colleagues in our network, again, our network is a Greater Plains Collaborative, we have a unique ability, I think, to help support the Veterans Administration and the military because of two things. One I've highlighted here is that the University of Utah leads a project called Vinci, where they actually help aggregate all the data from the Veterans Administration hospitals, which if you've been here to Columbia to our campus, you'll note it's right across the street. That's common at many medical centers around the country. So they have the access that we could potentially link Veterans Administration data to the rest of our data and provide much better support for research. 
The second issue I would highlight that I'll, I'll point out later on as well is Cerner is the electronic health record of choice for the departments of defense and the Veterans Administration. So I think here specifically at the University of Missouri, we can do work with our strong partner Cerner to think about how we better serve the veterans and, and make those opportunities for advancing research uh, more harmonious between uh, civilian electronic health record systems and practices and our veterans population and our active duty populations and dependents. Um, the other things called for in this proposal are really continuing to focus on getting complete clinical data. So not just billing information about how the procedures were paid for, but actually richer clinical information. Another thing that's interesting to note is I, while we did some strong work with two insurance companies, Anthem, which is strongly present in Missouri, and Humana, PCORI has decided not to fund those two health plans anymore, and they're much more interested in us linking to health plans as needed. And that really is only fair because while we have Anthem insurance common in Missouri, it might be exclusionary to the fact that we see a lot of people on United insurance. And you might be in another state like Iowa that has very little Anthem insurance. So as I'll point out on the next slide, our ability to link to different payers is probably going to be a, a more strong focus for us moving forward continued focus that we need to do on patient engagement and recruitment. And so here in Missouri, we need to strengthen our ability to put boots on the ground, engage patients electronically and in person to, to be participating in these studies. Uh, there's a renewed call for us to do what is called natural language processing. So for people um, who've seen their physician, they may have noticed that she sometimes pokes around in the computer and enters things like an order for a drug. But at other times, she reflects upon her conversation with you and she types a narrative report or dictates a narrative report. So a lot of the richness of the clinical impression and the assessment of how to, to manage the patient is recorded in narrative form. And so um, if you don't go after the gold buried in the note, you may be missing a large picture of understanding health. Um, our colleagues that we seek to join us at the University of Texas in Houston are incredibly strong at natural language processing and recognized nationally. Other items called for are embedding research more in the workflow. So at a lot of places and historically research was viewed as, oh, that's the research team, they're over there. And for busy clinicians and patients, it was seen as an intrusion. And we just need to get better at thinking about how are lightweight ways where we can make it more seamless to integrate research collection, research processes in the clinical workflow for the patient and the clinicians involved at all levels. Some examples of that are is um, most campuses around the country use a very popular system that's free called REDCap. And there are new data standards called FIRE that allow us to share data between research systems like REDCap and health record systems like Cerner and Epic. And we want to strengthen that ability across our campuses. Um, we want to continually focus on better data security and privacy, and also the ability to do data quality follow up and go back and look at the source. And then finally, I'll just highlight a little bit this idea of linking data assets. So PCORNET, a couple years back, we did a request for proposal and we chose a specific technology to allow us to link data in a de-identified way. So we don't have to share protected health information to know, for example, who's covered by Cigna insurance that visits Mizzou's healthcare system. Um, my wife has Cigna, I live in Kansas City, so I'm actually on Cigna, which I don't even know. I mean, there may not be a lot of people on Cigna here. Maybe they're on other plans. So if I had an idea and I talked to people at Cigna Insurance around a quality improvement project, we could get all excited about it, but we ought to at least know, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is it worth doing a project together? How much of our data matches up with data that they may hold at a health payer? So DataVant provides an ability to replace patient information with de-identified tokens and then we can kind of match them together without identifying the patient just to figure out what the potential is to link our data together. And we have the potential to do that not just with our data and insurance companies and consumer data managed that's already linked by DataVan, but I think we have a strong opportunity to do the same thing with health insurance data and then over time with our state agencies to help uh, us track, uh, for example, could be useful in immunization tracking. So this is a picture, um, you can um, later on obtain the slides, but um, just to give you a sense of the ecosystem of all the people with data is incredibly vast. 
So you have EMR systems like Cerner and Epic up here and Meditech. You've got people who run pharmacies uh, like Walgreens and CVS. They've got a piece of the picture. You've got companies like McKesson to distribute supplies. They have a piece of the picture. Wearable devices like Apple Watches and Garmin are a piece of the health picture. And lab systems, you may send genomic testing to a specific precision health testing company. And wouldn't it be great to link that data? So our goal is to kind of have Mizzou, UMKC affiliates have that ability through the Greater Plains Collaborative to kind of be a circle that could be intersected with these various uh, systems that are out there that could potentially help us complete a richer picture of health. Okay. The, uh, the next thing then I want to start talking a little bit about where are we at right now on some of the infrastructure Rick mentioned. So as we know, next gen is a vision where we're going to accelerate discovery around the country. We're going to revolutionize healthcare uh, and create these cross disciplinary collaborations. And then he mentioned as well, recently announced just in November is the creation of an analytics center called uh, the Data Science and Analytics Center at UMKC and Mizzou. And I'm trying to uh, work together so that we're working together as a team on data infrastructure that can serve both needs. And so without further ado, um, this next slide is going to kind of show you some of the current focus. So what we're developing is a system that we've named in honor of the kangaroo mascot at uh, UMKC, the Outback. And in the data world, there's been a, you know, traditionally you've heard of data warehousing where you kind of build a regularized common data model like I've described, but oftentimes what you first do is you create a lake where you can kind of just park data initially and then over time determine how quickly you want to integrate things into consistent data forms, but creating a lake is an important component for kind of creating a, an ecosystem of information. So uh, since November, we've now obtained approval to actually stand up our data lake with Amazon Web Services and a database vendor called Snowflake. And we've actually populated Snowflake with data from the Mizzou healthcare system. We then are creating pipelines for taking it from data in a database to actually start to be analyzed on the cloud. And we had a kickoff meeting this Monday with the Amazon Web Services technical team to ensure that as we develop these pipelines for managing data, we're doing it in a manner that follows best practices for data security and privacy. And we'll then be poised to support analysis, but also sharing of data, both identified and de-identified as governed by protocols. And I'd like to call out Drs. Tripti Joshi and Richard Hammer here at University of Missouri, who started doing work on thinking about how we're gonna integrate the, that genomic testing result data to go complementary to the clinical biomedical data that I'm focused on bringing in initially from things like the Cerner EHR. We also had an initial conversation with colleagues at St. Luke's who are, are similarly interested in advancing precision health in cancer and thinking of how we could work together. And then we want to do this also as we've moved the headquarters for the Greater Plains Collaborative to Missouri. Um, we have a large project that links and has copies of the claims data for Medicare patients. We want to bring that safely and securely to Missouri. So this shows you the Mizzou data lake uh, and the UMKC data lake or the Outback. And so what you see on the picture is we have various systems coming in from health records that go into, whoops, that go in, that draw from things like the Truman EHR, the University of Missouri uh, EHR, electronic health record, as well as at University of Missouri, we use a separate billing system from General Electric. And we bring that data in, we do what's called staging, where we kind of park the data, and then we transform the data into that common data model. And then additionally, we can create de-identified views of that data. So we, that allows some individuals to be able to securely look at data and there's no risk that they would breach patient privacy. So we're in the process, we've accomplished this task. It was successfully approved by PCORI in January. And we're now deploying the environments where people can use different statistical packages of their choice and machine learning packages to conduct detailed analyses. We're also bringing up that I2B2 tool again so it can start accessing fresh copies of the data. Additionally, we're working to, as I mentioned with Tripti and Richard, to bring over the genomic data on our patients who've been tested by companies like Foundation Medicine so we can link that data to the patient level data. So that way we can look at rich genomic history and variants in combination with their clinical information and their outcomes. 
that project I mentioned where we have the insurance claims data, this also provides you a picture of this idea about when you overlap data together. In this environment, we currently have several years of Medicare and Medicaid claims data on overall over 25 million individuals. So what you see, for example, in Missouri is we have claims or insurance payments on over 2.6 million patients in the state of Missouri. Of those, 177,000 have been seen either largely at the University of Missouri uh, health system or at KU Med, and maybe a little bit of bleed over from Iowa. So that way we can marry up their insurance information together with the data from our electronic health record. And where that can be really valuable is a lot of people may come here for care for a specific condition, but their primary care, their day-to-day -day information may be received back home in a, another county or a smaller place. And you don't have any picture of their health once they leave our environment. So linking to claims information can give us a broader picture of health of the patient. So we equivalently are looking to take that environment and then bring it just like in the other picture, we were bringing data from Truman and Mizzou and then other genomic data. Here, we're gonna bring in the Medicare data and Medicaid data. And then we have a linked file that allows us to link that data to the common data models, these things from each of the 12 institutions in the Greater Plains Collaborative. So we then link that data together and provide the same set of tools to investigators. Um, so uh, I want to close with just some observations and a couple uh, moving forward notes and then how you can engage the team. So I, I really see we just have a wealth of opportunity to work together across our two schools of medicine, two schools of engineering, and then over time reaching out to our RALA colleagues, uh, UMSL colleagues. Um, and that's really a great opportunity that Missouri has. Um, Another item I think that's really nice about where we are is we have a very strong mix of rural and urban populations and there's increased interest um, in serving uh, vulnerable populations and I think both our urban populations and rural populations are especially of interest and so our ability to do this statewide and cross urban and rural areas go from clinical health data where we, we have stepped, but also expand to the genomic data is going to be increasingly a, a great opportunity we have. We've got great support and a lot of interest in philanthropy. So notably, uh, Dr. Uh, Gary or Mr. Gary Forsey has helped fund the DSEC initiative, but we've also worked on some proposals for the Block Foundation to help catalyze our informatics efforts here to engage the urban underserved population in Kansas City. And then John Spurtis, whose faculty at UMKC has been worked to uh, expand his quality and value uh, consortium efforts that he's, he's developed over the last several years. I see Cerner as an incredibly strong partner, and we have the potential to really push these interoperable data standards that support this national uh, research for federal agencies, and especially at the intersection with Cerner and military care. Um, so, Notably, I think as mentioned by Rick, there's an entity called the Tiger Institute. I think working with the Tiger Institute, what I would like to do, and I'm working with leadership there, is to expand its focus from looking at how we strengthen MU healthcare um, and the local campus to, to kind of expand our horizon to say, hey, let's bring in the people from outside to look at what we can do to lead nationally. And I think bringing in some other medical centers that use Cerner and, and think about how we can help support the Cerner community more broadly, but also bring in representatives from the Veterans Administration and the military. Um, and also there's been a lot of strong work led by Bill Turpin here to engage other industry partners that cover other parts of the healthcare segment uh, to come together and create a strong sandbox as mentioned above that can serve both our faculty, but also industry partners. Um, and then finally, I'd like to leave you with a slide on how to engage the team. So um, we have, we're updating this infrastructure minute by minute, like I mentioned, just had a meeting on Monday. Um, so as we update that infrastructure, we, we will redo our website. We were just emailing with uh, Rick's chief of staff, Kim Kimenow, about our planning there. But in the meantime, we have two intake processes for Mizzou and UMKC. Um, and wherever possible, please use our intake forms and emails. That way, if someone's on vacation, the broader team can cover for you. Um, and then currently, we this is by no means all the people supporting the effort. It's a very big team effort from IT across both campuses, um, or I should say information technology and investigators everywhere. But would like to call out uh, Suman and Jeremy and Sean at the Kansas City campus, and then Katie, Mosa, Vasanthi, Corey, Arana, Aaron, Song, uh, deep 
at Praveen and Tripti at the Mizzou campus. Um, so we're working both on, on kind of the technology, the data and the informatics. And I would also like to highlight, I don't mean to be exclusionary, there are very strong biostatistical teams and epidemiology teams on both of those campuses as well that we liaison with to support investigators. And now, if you're intrigued by the idea of going from local to regional to national, um, as shown kind of in this continuum down here. Um, Abu Mosa is our principal investigator for Procornet at our site here in Missouri. And so he's been the longstanding person who works with people to think about supersizing their research planning. And he and I <clears throat> can help facilitate things going forward, not just for Mizzou, but from the UM system campuses overall. And we can then provide kind of some recommendations on whether you should start regional or go national in terms of how you approach this. And a lot of these efforts may also be things we would coordinate together with Washington University, which is the CTSA hub for the Mizzou campus and the University of Kansas Medical Center, which is the CTSA hub for UMKC. So sometimes while I've focused this talk on PCORnet, there are other national initiatives funded by the NIH, which we're plugged into and looking to expand. Notably, I think both KU and WashU are submitting their CTSA renewals, and there's increased uh, focus, I know for sure, here in Columbia on stronger work with WashU. So apologize for my throat, but with that, I'll take any questions. Well, Dr. Waitman, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right, that was terrific. And um, I'm learning, every time you talk, I learn new stuff. So are we, now we have Outback, is that what we're calling this? Um, is there gonna be a picture of a tiger and a kangaroo on it or? That's correct. So if you noticed, I had spliced together the logo <coughs> of the uh, Mizzou and UMKC, but we've got yeah, the Outback. Yeah, I saw that. <clears throat> so I think we have, we have two motifs. We can go with Southeast Asia of tigers, and then we have a whole subcontinent of Australia with kangaroos and koalas where we can name projects after. Well, well I know we have to get serious here in just a minute, but when we uh, recruited you to the University of Missouri, we said we were recruiting a new species, a tiger roo. That's so, right. Right, so we'll have, to, all right. Uh, Mary thank Hindle, you. are you going to MC the questions? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Waitman. And we have quite a few comments that are coming through. So this first one, they're talking about how this effort seems very promising and an important component of next gen. I'm curious to know more about the application of these data beyond clinical trials. What do you anticipate being the process for ac accessing the population health data that's available? Would there be special approval or IRB processes? And what would the associated costs be for studies or pilot studies? That's a great question. So one is, um, I will not go back to the slides, but if you looked at those slides, you would notice how we provide data and we have that ability to go back to protected health data, but for the most part, we can serve up either de-identified data or what is called a limited data set. So there's basically, in general, three flavors of data. Places where you're providing protected health information. On the other extreme, you're providing de-identified data or even anonymized data. And then in the middle, there is something called a limited data set, which preserves the date and time of data but removes most of the protected health information like names and medical record numbers. So the question about what regulatory processes will be governed by what type of data you want. So in certain cases, um, you may not need IRB approval at all to look at the identified data. We will create the environment where you can submit a request. We will have fairly quick review to grant you access to the de-identified environment as we get this approved by IT and with our compliance offices. In other cases, if you need protected health information or limited data, you will need to obtain IRB approval. Um, the level of review required will vary depending upon um, whether it's limited data or identifiable data. And I think that will streamline the timeliness of the approval. Um, the cost issue and, and comment here is, you may need this data for either like you say clinical trials or you may wanna do machine learning. Um, you may be a data scientist, an engineer who doesn't want to touch protected health data at all, but would love to look at this large data and, and discover new knowledge um, or at least discover information that may turn into knowledge. 
So we are largely looking to get this environment stood up and then have a service model, which I think for many services like I2B2 and small requests, we'll be able to fulfill those as before at low to no cost if you can do it in a manner that does not consume much time from the staff. And so that's, all, that's kind of the model I operated under with at KU. You know, we provide an infrastructure as the teams currently provide like REDCap. Everybody loves REDCap, we provide support for that and it's underwritten by the School of Medicine on both campuses. Other things where you start getting into data, we need to take a look at like how we balance the work and have some contribution of funding for the effort put in in some cases. But we hope to have a lot of this be kind of driven uh, where if it doesn't take up a lot of effort, um, it has a low to no cost. If it is something that is requiring effort and cost, you need to budget for it. And really um, <clears throat> to invoke the spirit of Tom Spencer, the campuses are very attuned to increasing our, our profile nationally and that's often counted by funding. So um, we're all interested in helping support funded proposals. So especially if you're developing a funded proposal, we really wanna work with you. What I find happens nationally is a lot of times people will support or underwrite costs locally. So you always need to keep in mind, if you're asking people at Iowa to do something for you, that's definitely a case typically where you need to start budgeting if you're taking up effort from other people. Uh, the plus side of that and creating funded proposals with other people is then they've got skin in the game and they've got excitement because they're winning too. So I think that really helps build your program and it increases your exposure nationally. So um, I think the cost is gonna depend upon the study type. It could range from couple hours worth of time to, in the case of some of these large collaborations, it can range into the tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending upon just how much is required. Thank you. And I'd like to remind everyone listening that if you have any questions, please do enter them into this Q&A um, section. Next question, I believe you might have answered on the um, Outback Data Lake area, but just in case, is co the common data model going to be used by all EMR, EHR providers such as Cerner and Epic? Well, and I would just say the common data model is used. So these common data models, notably the PCORNET common data model I talked about today, the other data models I would say that are, are commonly used in research nationally is something called OMOP that grew out of a partnership between academics and Janssen Pharmaceutical. And then the third has been kind of the I2B2 ontologies and data models. Those are all supported by health systems and health record vendors of all types. Um, the pragmatic issue for academic medical centers is the, the predominant vendor of choice is Epic. So when you look at PCORNET, the majority of sites in Epic are running Epic and they've converted their data into the PCORNET common data model. Uh, we've done the same here for Cerner and we'll be doing that to transform the data for Cerner at Partners in Kansas City. So that kind of leads into um, the uh, question that's lower down in the um, rank here, not rank, but do all 12 institutions in the on the horizons use Cerner or some or Epic? Um, and would they be, and it says a BJC, I'm sorry, I'm not really sure what that is. Yeah, that's Barnes Jewish uh, Christian. Thank that's you. a health system associated with WashU. Yeah, so all, all of the systems, they mainly use Epic. You know, if you counted noses, the people using Cerner in our subnetwork of Cornet are us, um, part of Indiana. They use a blend of Epic and Cerner. Um, other partners of Cornet, like University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, is an Epic Cerner blended shop. Um, we've got um, Marshfield Clinic had a homegrown EHR called Cattails, but they're moving to Cerner. But most partners are using Epic. So if you look at Southwestern, San Antonio, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, Medical College, they're using Epic. So what I think is important about doing PCORNET is if you're an Epic customer or a Meditech customer and you're a research academic place, being in an open network like PCORNET lets the Cerner people join at the table just like the Epic people. Great, thank you. Are there opportunities for UM system colleagues at the UMSL campus to access Cornet and collaborate on research? Yes, that was where I was saying on the last slide. Yeah, this network, and that's an important point about this network. This network takes not, I, I made reference on the slide to there's a front door for the national network and kind of a side porch for the Glider Plains Collaborative. We're open to, to collaborating with people who don't necessarily have to be at a site that's harmonizing all their data. So um, we've done projects both with uh, faculty and, and organizations. So an example would be that heart failure study, the PROVIDE HF study. 
the person who had the question who funded that work was Novartis. Uh, we had another project working with Novo Nordisk that was funded working with investigators outside of the network. Um, we've actually shared data with the NIH National Library of Medicine, so um, definitely we would be interested in working with you at the other campuses. Great. Then I have a comment from Dr. Farah. Um, thank you for using the term EHR as opposed to EMR. Indeed, it is a multidisciplinary approach to patient that are, um, care that is being recorded. And then there was no reference to a specific category of Hispanic Latino in the race ethnic breakdown in um, pages, pages 16 through 19. Is there a separate ethnic category or any way, another way to pinpoint that for data analytics? Yes, so that's especially right. I gave you an example of how we standardize race, but ethnicity is not the same thing as race. You could be, you know, um, you could have one race and also ethnicity is a separate thing. So there's a separate field in the database for recording uh, Hispanic ethnicity. Thank you. For those of us who have used I2B2 previously, it has been problematic and not reflective of volume seen in clinic. Have these issues been addressed before moving to larger scale studies? Yes, um, but that's why we're rebuilding this. Um, we, we ran into some challenges, I would say, before with the data that was loaded in I2B2 at especially UMKC was based only on the Cerner system. It had some challenges of not bringing in the billing information. So then you wouldn't see if you were searching for certain things in diagnosis codes that were stored in the billing system, you didn't get that data back. So that's where kind of aligning this with our PCORnet data quality standards, I think will really help us profile that we're getting a better quality picture of our data. Um, we can share with people who've got a follow-up question on that. What's nice about the Cornet is it's kind of brutal, but every quarter we have to have our data be checked for data quality. So if we have a problem where we aren't mapping our medications to the national standard, or if we see deviations where our encounters drop down, we get a nasty note that we're not up to snuff. And so I think before the I2B2 was great. So let me give credit to Cerner. They earlier than anybody else provided kind of self-service access to clinical data with I2B2. Uh, but the downside was they didn't have control over all the data sources and the focus on data quality that you get when you have people on the ground looking at the data. So you'd have data gaps and it'd raise a lot of questions. I think our goal of tying it to the quality checks for Procornet is gonna increase your confidence in the data you're looking at as well as you'll be in touch with team members if need be that can go back to source and figure out where discrepancies arise. Thank you. I think this is kind of a great question to go on the other side. So rather than having the experience, for those that do not have extensive experience with big data management, is there also some initial support with how to handle the resulting data from these queries? Sure. So that's there's two ways to look at this. One will be I think as we deploy this with the PCORnet tools, there are some existing nice tools that help you get you an early way to look at some analysis around descriptive statistics. And that was developed by reasonably competent people at some small schools called Harvard and Duke. So they've done a good job of providing some self-service tools that can get you started. And so we're gonna be working with a team to give you entree to that. That said, if you're thinking about data it really behooves you to touch base with people that work with, say, Jillian Bartlett here and the biostatistics team with Greg, or working with uh, folks like Monica and Jennifer Allsworth at UMKC who are trained in study design methods so that um, you're thinking about your problem in a way that's going to generate the type of answer you want. So I think by no means do I want to declare that we're solving everything here. We're going to have a stronger team, more tools. We'll have some deep learning analyses and other things where we may want to work with Shi Ren Shu and others in the Institute for Data Science and Informatics. So it really is a team effort, but I think we'll have more components that, that you can bring or that other people in the community can bring that can help address that. Great. Thank you. And then I, we have some really nice comments. Thanking you for your presentation and Dr. Barron for the comments on the new species, Tiger Roo. Um, they're also mentioning the School of Pharmacy is very interested in this area that you're talking about and growing in the future with these research areas. Um, and I will send these um, comments to you. Um, and then the, in the next one, the next comment, again, some really great praise for the presentation today. And as you know, UMKC has developed a research project in the medical neuroscience course that asks the students to ask a unique question about a neurological disease and answer it using data from Cerner. 
while it's been a huge success, it places a lot of burden on our faculty and staff to extract and clean the data. So is there a thought about developing a training module with perhaps banks of data sets that have been extracted for perhaps other projects? I, I would say we ought to talk about that. I think there's a couple avenues. Like you say, you could um, create it in a manner that we have a pre-canned data set people can look at. The other thing we did on a smaller scale was we had med students take a class that was part of the CTSA, Masters of Clinical Research Program, where we would teach them in a semester how to you learn how to formulate their question, query the data, and then actually organize their information into an analytic set and conduct an analysis that kind of created a really nice progression for people who want to be researchers. I think we also had, um, led by Ed Ellerbeck at KU, a lot of the medical school curriculum that was focused on quality would use both REDCap and I2B2 to run a lot of their projects. So I think we'll probably be able to come up with ways both at a longer, say, semester level class, as well as smaller classes and workshops in the med school curriculum and others that could take advantage of the infrastructure. And that's why creating de-identified views, but also the ability to get your hands on the data, um, I think is gonna be important. And I'd also point out that's also gonna be important for engineering. Uh, my, my hope would be we're able to engage all people in different parts of this. And in some ways, creating multidisciplinary classes where we bring different disciplines together could be very exciting. Thank you. What types of biosamples do you have or expect to have? In addition to genomic data, do you plan to include other omics data, proteomics, metabolomics mix? <laughs> I would say we plan to have what we have that we actually have. Um, and also it will have some bit of a cost component to it. Um, so let me, you know, as an example, um, we would have, um, if you want to know, do we have it? It kind of depends on who the we is. So if we were looking at this institution where I'm in Columbia right now, um, the Department of Pathology would have paraffin blocks banked. And so what I think we need to do is just know, um, you would know basically on the number of pathology uh, orders made and the procedures performed by pathology for uh, patho you know, interpretation, you would know how many people we have banked as paraffin blocks. If you want to know where they might have fresh samples or blood specimens available and consented in a biorepository, we have work to do, I think, as a campus for how we organize biospecimens. And what I would say is we'll work. At, what's fun about it, the informatics side is at certain levels, if you were organizing that in a spreadsheet, we could link the spreadsheet in. So I think our goal will be there's two parts to this. One is we can link in whoever's holding specimens to know who it's held by and what they're holding. And I think as we work on that, that will probably highlight places where the campuses may wanna create more consistency around how that's managed. So when I mentioned previously, we had a call with Osama Taufik and uh, other physicians affiliated with St. Luke's. If you look at it from a, a counting patient's perspective, they probably have a much larger cancer footprint with their pathology group over there. So if we could create partnerships with them to know who they're holding samples on, that could tap the broad investigator tool uh, pool into a larger area. So we plan to work on that as well as with WashU. Your question about proteomics and metabolomics, I think on clinical practice, it's probably not as widely deployed, but if we can find out where that data exists, we can link it. But my sense is um, this is gonna be more data that is, is known and conducted in a manner that's linked to the health system. So it may be fairly small at this point. Okay, great. Um, and last question um, is, what challenges do you foresee when attempting to integrate genetic data beyond oncogene panels that are small numbers of genes, for example, exomes into the EHR living document? Well, there's you bring up an interesting point on the integrating into the EHR. I mean, in the short term, what Tripti's looking at is when we do send outs for molecular testing to a lot of these genomic companies like Foundation and Tempus, in many cases, you can insist that they bring, they let you have your data back. So with Foundation, they actually store their data on Amazon. So I think it's going to be increasingly easier for us to say, give us access back to our BAM files, so more of our binary files about the data. There are certain files that are even richer called FASTSeq files, which may or may not be available. They may not persist them quite as long. So I think what you'll see is we want to get access to as raw a data as we can. We want to be sensitive to the cost for storage. You know, what do we need access to to copy versus we can link to what our vendors provide? And then um, 
how we then make determinations over what would make it back into the health record is something we would work together with pathology and the clinical teams. You know, you, you probably want to keep some of that data where there hasn't been the determination over whether a variant is significant or not. You may want to keep that living in a data layer kind of below the EHR, but then when things are interpreted and become more relevant, then it can kind of bubble up into the health record system and then be brought in discreetly so it can be actionable. Thank you so much, Dr. Waitman. Dr. Barron, any final comments? No, that was just terrific, Dr. Waitman. And now everyone can see why I was so eager to recruit Dr. Waitman to the University of Missouri. He's really uh, ramping up the shops on both campuses very quickly and allowing our faculty and students to really uh, dive into doing uh, healthcare data informatics in a modern way. Uh, so we have a lot to, uh, a long way to go, but I think we're now off to an amazing start with Dr. Waitman's arrival. So I did want to remind people that in April, is it April 7th, Mary, our next Discovery Grand Rounds? 6th. April 6th, 6th. Our, our next Discovery uh, Next Gen Precision Health series is Dr. Ann Sales from the University of Michigan, who's an expert in implementation science research. She's a RN, PhD, and she's going to be visiting the campus. Uh, and we're just, we're going to host her for a couple of days and she's uh, going to give us a, a talk on implementation science research. So stay tuned for announcements on that one. And once again, thank you all for tuning in to this month's Next Gen Precision Health Discovery Lecture Series. Thank you very much.